think you're going to save money by using all these, you know, these leftover. Oh, come on. One of the selling points bales. is you have all your friends over and you just stack, yeah, and you do a, stack yeah, straw bales. a plaster party. Yeah. 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 It, it's, you don't, it doesn't work. I mean, I guess if you have enough friends, but I mean, teaching people how to plaster, it's going to take <laughs> no, you just as long as doing it yourself. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Associate Editor Matt Milham. Hello. Hi, Matt. And Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hey. Thanks for being here, Rob. Thanks. You too, Matt. Hmm. I appreciate it. <laughs> please. <laughs> it's such a nice day today here. Uh, please email, email us your questions at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, we've gotten a number of uh, emails regarding our discussion of, uh, what would you call it, building resilience? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right? Mm -hmm. um, so this comes from... Doug in Central Colorado. I just watched episode 145, and I wanted to comment on two related areas. First was the discussion of whole house fans. Before building our Colorado retirement home, we lived in Omaha for 40 years in a house built in 1910. The house had radiators for heat and no ductwork, so central air was not a viable option on a young school teacher's budget. I installed a whole house fan in the ceiling of the upstairs hall. It was great when we had cool, dry nights about four weeks out of the year. That's what I would expect in the Midwest, right? Sure. Um, but most of the summer, it was too humid. In our new home at 8,000 feet in central Colorado, I wish I had installed a whole house fan. Summer days seem to be getting hotter, but the nights are still quite cool. I want to get rid of the hot air in the house and bring in the cool night air. So I think that's what we said, right? It was that yeah, we, in we the right climate. We definitely touched on that, but you know that that's a point that I think really we've forgotten in the home building industry we you know we're so used to air, central heating and and cooling systems that it means you can build a house any way you feel like and expect it to work but that's not entirely true you know it's it's like there it used to be you could there was a time when you could drop someone anywhere in the country and just by the local architecture you could know what kind of a climate you were in yeah true so you know he makes a good point and it's something that even though we can rely on well insulated envelopes and and uh, efficient heating systems, it, we really it, it, it's in our interest to to do some detailing based on local climates. Yeah, and you can look to the you know local historic architecture for clues on what that what works. Um, I, I think if we had a knock against the uh, whole house fans, it was in most climates. Uh, it's not going to help because you're going to bring in humid air at, at nighttime and it's yeah. not going to cool Except it off. Except for, like he pointed out, a few weeks out of the year when yeah. the temperature's just in the right range. Um, he adds, where you live does make a huge difference as to the best building practice. We don't have much of a risk of earthquake or hurricanes and tornadoes are rare. We do, however, live with the constant threat of wildfire, which is one of the things we didn't talk about in our discussion of uh, resilience. Um, we are in rocky soil, rocks and gravel, so soil moisture is not a big issue. But at 8,000 feet, UV really does a number on vinyl windows, which I think was probably the coolest part of his letter. Yeah, there. yeah. and on skin. The worst, <laughs> the worst sunburn I ever got was at the top of Pike's Peak. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't wear a hat. I was like, eh, not too bad. It's you know, it's crazy that you don't really think about things like that. I mean, the, the only experience because we don't ever have any sunshine here in the Northeast. Yeah, I mean, the the only effects I've ha I've noticed being at those altitudes out in Colorado were uh, when one I was driving my dad's old carbureted Ford Bronco up over the Rockies and the thing just could not make it because it just was, not, was not enough set air up for yeah. for that type of air. Did and, you put the uh, choke on? <laughs> yeah, no, it, this was automatic joke. I didn't have much choice. But then also my wife said she's been on photo shoots out there. She used to work for a fine gardening magazine. And uh, she was like, oh, yeah, we." the people would be like, oh, yeah, we put Vaseline in our nostrils because it's so dry out here. Otherwise, you'd have, like, nosebleeds all the time. <laughs> I think I would move before I put Vaseline up my yeah. nose. <laughs> but, you know, back to the, the point of, you know, different needs for different areas. And he says, oh, I don't have to worry about earthquakes or tornadoes that much. I'll tell you, that's one of the reasons why I'm happy to live in the Northeast is not only those natural disasters. I mean, if you live near the coast, you got to worry about it more. But uh, 
but also uh, I gotta tell you, poisonous, I, poisonous <laughs> animals too. You know, dangerous animals. Sure. We're, <laughs> Glad we don't have Australia. scorpions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I gotta tell you, there's been more natural disasters since I've moved to Connecticut in my life than any other time. Yeah, they've been lying to you about that whole safe being safe in the northeast. <laughs> it seems like I guess. every year we have a you know week long power outage as an example. Yeah, and and you know we always say, oh, the Midwest has all the tornadoes. We've had some pretty good tornadoes. I mean, they're they're not they're not big and they don't last very long, but they do some. They've done some damage in some yeah. local towns. Oh, I know. And I mean, the East Coast is pretty densely populated. You know, when they're hitting in the Midwest, <laughs> a lot of yeah. times there's not a lot of houses. Yeah, th- yeah, but if you know if you hit a major city, yeah. So uh, this is from Randy in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, this is in reference to a discussion we had on how do you hire a good contractor, and he has a good suggestion, so I'm going to share it with everybody. As a homeowner, I've had good results getting contractor recommendations from my HVAC guy. I've used his services for at least 15 years. So there you go. So she has, or he has a relationship with this contractor and asks a contractor who the other contractors they should hire because they know everybody, right? Yeah. That seems like a great suggestion. So there you go, folks. If you need to hire a contractor, ask one you already have a relationship with. They're going to know who the good people are. All right. So you started telling me this morning that your solar install started happening. Yeah, the the uh, solar company has their own in-house roofing team, and they're the guys who do, do the boots that the rack sits on, uh, or the posts, I don't know what you would call them exactly. Uh, the mounting so, so uh, yeah, they fixtures. basically have to do an, an array of little flanged posts that get tied into the shingles somehow. So I'll uh, hopefully get a better look at how that works when I get home today. Are they doing it on both sides of your gable roof? Uh, so basically, what my house is two rectangular two-story portions, and each one has its own gable roof, and they have faces on the north and the south side each. So I'm only getting the two south faces. Uh, which are about 40 degrees, I think. So it's actually, I think, just about the right angle for our our latitude for solar panels to, to be mounted flat on the roof. Cool. What's the, uh, how long will the whole process take? They're there for maybe half a day today um, doing the preliminary stuff for the rack, and they said that uh, they'll be there to, on Two, two more full days, I think, to, to wrap it all up. So three days total, two and yeah. a half? Yeah, something like that. It's amazing to me. What do you have to say? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I want solar in my house. I do too. And for a long time, I couldn't because of the trees, but I have way fewer trees because of the storm we had in the spring. Yeah. I've got um, great mm-hmm. exposure at my house and, like, my whole front lawn, too. I could put panels on that probably if I wanted to, but yeah. I don't want to do that. Ground racking is very expensive, though. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I was saying to you, Patrick, is that um, if I had the space, I've got a narrow lot, and I've, I have I really hate living in New England and not having at least a carport, and if not a garage. And if I had the space, I, I've always said solar just seems to make way more sense on a parking structure because then – You've got it closer to the ground for servicing, and you've got it on a structure that if it does leak, you're not going to be doing a major, any major major damage. So, uh, so your concern is that if the mounts ever leaked through the, through the roof, it wouldn't be a big deal? Yeah, yeah, because uh, especially my, my house, uh, half of my attic is a finished attic, so if it did start leaking, you know, it would, I wouldn't be able to tell exactly where that e- easily, and I probably wouldn't know for quite some time. Is that really a concern? I mean, we've been doing solar for decades now. Like, have they not figured out how to make the mounts well, watertight? Well, I, I think they, you know, I think it's definitely come a long way. I mean, I, I've i seen in some older installations where the people were just literally just bolting right through the roof and siliconing the, the feet on. <laughs> I don't know how well, well that could possibly go that wrong. <laughs> And, you know, I'm not really worried about it. I mean, each of these things gets uh, flashed into the shingles the w- same way you would do a vent boot for a, for a plumbing, you know. Penetration, egg, yeah. Penetration. And uh, it's... Those it, things are terrible, though. I hope it's better yeah. than that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not... I wouldn't say that I'm actually worried about it, uh, but I, I, it's just nice to have that peace of mind if you have the option to put it on something you're not worried about. Do they give you a warranty for the water tightness of the assembly? Uh, you know, I'll have to check my contract on. Get oh, back, my get goodness. That would have been the that. first thing I would do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
all the power in the world doesn't matter if it's like causing it to water to leak in your house. Yeah. All right. This first question is from Joshua Gillum of Charleston, South Carolina. That's another great city. Have mm. you been? No. Oh, it's oh. very, very beautiful. No, I haven't. Have you been? No, it's one of my wife's favorite places that she's visited on the oh, East it's Coast. It's really though. nice. Um, I had a photo shoot down there. Uh, Joshua writes, I love the show and have been listening since day one. I won't bore you with pleasantries and get straight to the point. I have a 1930 Charleston single house that has been converted into a duplex, one unit upstairs and one down. I'm currently gut renovating the upstairs unit and wondering if you guys would go the extra mile to make this place airtight or if I'm just wasting my money. In the interior, I've already installed R15 rock wool between the studs, Tyvek house wrap on all the walls and ceilings, and taped at the seams and around the outlets. There's sill sealer over the studs, then drywall, and 20 inches of cellulose in the attic. I'm going to replace all the siding and windows on this house as well. It currently has three layers of siding. The original wood siding nailed directly to the studs with no sheathing, then some kind of faux brick panels that may contain asbestos, followed by foam board and vinyl siding. I was planning on going back with zip 5 8 sheathing, one inch of comfort board, I, f I assume that's a foam insulation, uh, furring strips followed by hardy plank siding. Am I crazy to spend all this money on a rental property that I will never live in? Should I just use OSB, then hardy plank, and skip all the efficiency measures? Also, the asbestos is a pain. I believe that. Anyway, <laughs> please steer me in the right direction. I think that one-inch comfort board is uh, the rigid mineral wool. Oh, okay. I think. Thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, that does sound right. Yeah. But so uh, anyway, one thing that mystifies me a bit here is the Tyvek on the inside. <laughs> this guy doesn't just think outside the box. He's, he's like he's kicked, really kicked out of the box and threw it in the shredder. Well, that, that Tyvek <laughs> on the inside is actually sounds very similar to what we were talking about the interior air, air barrier. barrier yeah. the, in I the think last that's yeah. his air barrier, and then I think the sill seal on the studs is meant to be a drywall gasket, mm -hmm. yep. which is cool. Which is fine, yeah. except that you've got drywall as an air barrier. Yeah, I think the Tyvek is unnecessary. Yeah, it's sort of like an extra layer that you don't really need. And and the same with the sill seal. I mean, if anything, that probably doesn't seal a heck of a lot better than the drywall screwed directly to the studs would. I don't know about that. I would uh, like to see that tested, but yeah. uh, um, there are companies that make gaskets for installing drywall with the aid idea of making it more airtight as mm -hmm. an air barrier. So I think that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, seams. <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm not I'm not gonna uh knock the knock those details up, but I, I am curious to know where he uh got the inspiration from them from like the DC it somewhere or Yeah. You know, but yeah. uh so Joshua, um <clears throat> let us know where you got the idea. I'm curious. But let's get to your question here. Um you're gonna rip all this stuff off and put five H sheathing, one inch of insulation uh, a rain screen, and then uh, fiber cement siding. Sounds good to me. Uh, that sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, he he is down south, so I'm not 100% familiar with how much better the insulation needs to be down there. But, I mean... Well, we it, exterior insulation is always a good idea because it stops uh, thermal bridging, right? So sure, it's sure. going to keep his uh, uh, place more comfortable for sure. And, and the fact that he's uh, the fact that he's a contractor, and it sounds like he's doing all, a lot of this work himself, uh, you know, that kind of drives the cost down. It's just a matter of those extra days and maybe a couple extra thousand dollars of materials, maybe not even that much. But um, so my suggestion to um, Joshua would be to explore um, the Huber product that has uh, polyiso insulation on the backside of it, Zip R. Uh, and uh, that would eliminate a step for you. But he, Charleston is surprisingly uh, a very active seismic zone. Did you know that? No. Yeah, if you look on the East Coast mass of the map of the seismic uh, risks, uh, there's a huge red spot over Charleston. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, so uh, in that instance, the foam layer on the backside of the sheathing um, doesn't offer the racking resistance. So the nail nailing schedules are pretty crazy for using that product. Yeah, so it might work. not work in that seismic zone. Yeah. Yeah. But but I mean, if, if it if it is an option, if he, I mean, uh, he should probably check with uh, maybe the local building uh, supply place that provides that material. Yeah. And my experience uh, in Charleston was that the building department was supremely helpful. Um, if you call them up, they'll be able to answer that for you. Yeah, I talked to a guy down there, and he, he was fantastic. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's been there forever. He has been there forever. Um, He's a but, treasure, national treasure, state treasure. 
<laughs> uh, he's amazing. But, uh, but so, you know, the, the thing about insulation retrofits, I mean, if you weren't already planning on tearing off all the sheathing and siding, it would be a tough call to, to, say, to do to this, justify? To, to justify all this extra work. Um, Especially given it's a rental unit. Let's be honest about that. Yeah. Sure, but, e <laughs> but even if it is your own home and you're planning on living there for 20 years, it's, uh, you know, adding those details when you're building a new house are usually a relatively small additional expense. But when you're doing retrofits, it's just... Uh, there's the math. Is, the math dollars. has just been really yeah. hard to justify in a lot of in a lot of cases. There's actually a really good article on BuildingGreen.com uh, called "Challenges of Existing Homes," and it's got a bunch of case studies of people trying to figure out that same sort of question. I'll put a link to that in the notes. There was another one too. The deep energy retrofits uh, have seldom have a good payback. Was another one. I don't. I don't that might not be the exact title. It probably isn't. But it was. That was the subject. But you know, but the thing is, in most of those cases, we're talking about people who, you know, their goal is to save money on the overall cost of living in their house over the period that they're living there. But if in you're in this unique situation where you do a lot of the work yourself and you're already planning on tearing off the sheath and going right down Why to not? the studs. It seems like in this instance, it's, it's sort of low-hanging fruit. And I would point out that... Um having your clients comfortable in your rental unit is going to be good for you and them, right? They're not, they're going to want to stay there. They, they might be willing to tolerate, you know, every rent increases every couple of years if the place is, you know, affordable to heat and comfortable to live in. Sure. And, and, heat and cool, I should say in Charleston. And you also got to think about the fact that it is a, it is an investment. You know, you're right now, the energy efficiency of a home isn't necessarily factored in as well as it m we might want it to be in the value of a house, but that could change in the, in the near future. To some people like us, I'm sure uh, that would be a selling point, right? If you pull out a stack of energy bills and like, look, look what it costs to heat and cool this place. Um, yeah, they, I, that they would be attractive. Yeah, you got to convince them that you've been keeping the heat at like, I don't know, 80 a degrees and not 55. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and also priorities change. I mean, uh, you know, he... he probably has the intention to keep this long term as a rental property but if he did need to sell it and at some point then you know having it in in better condition than than it could have been is not a bad thing i mean i was talking to uh colin our video guy about that house up in vermont with the the roll roofing on it yes and he was saying you know the guy who owns that place thinks oh 10 years i'm going to rebuild this place but he was saying, honestly, he, he feels like if the guy has a couple of good years in business, he'll probably do it a lot sooner than he was thinking. And yeah. then so that that idea of needing the 10 year investment on those on those shingles, maybe the roll roofing holding it over for a couple of years isn't such a bad deal. Totally agree. So. Uh, Joshua, thanks for writing. Let us know what you uh, decide to do on your. Oh, and you got to deal with the asbestos, right? That was the last thing I wanted to say. Is uh, it's tempting to like rip that off and throw it in a dumpster, but if you get caught, it will be bad. Well, I mean, in some states, if you're the owner, you can do it yourself. Then you just need to find a place to. But the disposal is the dispose issue. Yes. Yeah, but you can actually take it off yourself. And uh, believe me, the neighbors are going to be watching what you're doing with that stuff. So do it right. Awful noisy with your papers. Yeah, that's your sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bad journalist. Sound effects. Okay. Who's this from? Mr. Woodrot. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, dear FHB podcast, love the show, and I'm glad that the Finkster is still around. So are we. That wasn't our name for him. That's what uh, Jeff called him. This might be a trivial question, but I'm going to ask you anyway because none of the builders here seem to know. Is wood rot contagious? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've never caught it myself, but I don't know. Um, I have a house that was built in 1902 with oak floor joists. In the early 1990s, air conditioning was added with ductwork in the crawl space, but the foundation vents were still open during this time. Oh, this is a disaster. This combo of cold AC ductwork and warm, moist air made a breeding ground for decay. I have some floor joists that I can insert my pocket knife in one quarter inch on the very bottom of the joist. Some floor, floor joists have a little soft punkiness to the outside, but still have some integrity. Others have a weakened spot in the middle, and I am in the process of replacing those joists. My question is, the joists that have 
a little exterior softness but still have some integrity? Do I need to spray sort of some sort of sealer on these joists to keep the wood digestive microbes at bay? Or do I have anything to worry about? Or do I not have anything to worry about? I should note I've stop, stopped up the foundation vents, placed 6 mil plastic on the crawl space floor, and up the foundation wall. I'm in the process of coming up with an idea of insulating this cross foundation, which should help with the excess excessive moisture issues. If the new wood touches any of the de decaying wood, will the rot spread to the new wood? That is a great question, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> what? You go ahead. I don't know. I don't know what to tell him. Um, oh, I those, dug, I those dug mold spores are going to be in there. Like forever, forever, anyway. Yes, and I think it's kind of like it it's not almost doesn't fungus. Yeah, the fungus. Yeah, yeah, is going to be in there anyway, and whether that's in contact with it or not, those spores are going to be all over those joists the second they get in there. Yes. So, go I mean, ahead. What, just, what do we tell them? <laughs> I think, well, any fungus kind of needs like it needs a bunch of stuff to sort of propagate. It three needs things. Three things. Well, moisture, food, or water, food. And the, right, the right temperature and oxygen. Sure. So it's going to have oxygen as long as you know we're not living in space. Planet, yeah, and you don't like sort of like create a <laughs> vacuum in that thing. Um, so uh, as long as uh, you can take down one of the legs, then you're kind of good. So, so like, so you, you can freeze it. <laughs> you can freeze that space. Mm, yep. You probably don't want to do that. Um, or you can keep the water out of it. It's probably the easiest one, and it sounds like he's done most of the work to get that done. So, I totally agree. I dug deep into wood decaying fungi yesterday, I got to tell you. And, yeah, I, uh, I saw your notes there. You did some serious research. Oh, my God. I was into it. It's like got my geek on here today. Um, so the first thing I did was went to the CBD, which is the Canadian Building Digest Decay of Wood paper, originally written in 1969 by M.C. Baker. And what I learned from this was that, like Matt said, we need to control one of those things that the fungus needs to, to grow. And fungus lives in temperatures that people like 65 to 100 degrees, approximately 95 degrees. So you can't freeze it, right? Because it's it in the basement. It doesn't make sense, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't heat it to 100 degrees, right? Right. So we're going to have to control the humidity. And I think he's on the right track with covering the, 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 the ground, with the plastic and the foundation walls and sealing up the crawl space vents is a great start. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no matter where you are in the world, there are spores for for mold. <laughs> and so it I've I've got oh, so I've got some that mold. photo. I've got this some fungus yeah. keeping me up last that's night. Gross. Um I've got fungus growing on a part of my basement where there was a leak once, and I've, I, this was years ago, and I have not completely eradicated it. And once I stopped that leak, it was, it, it, it's pretty much been in stasis ever since. And, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's probably a good idea to, to figure out how to check, check the moisture content in there. I don't know if he would want to get any kind of humidity uh, I'd say a moist, moisture meter is going to be really key because you're going to want to be checking those those um, the moisture content of the joist because um, the rot will keep going until you bring down the moisture to a uh, appropriate level, which is... Yeah. I'd be a little bit worried about some of that mold getting into the house or some of that fungus getting into the house. So totally. I, I might consider putting a, a very low watt uh, vent fan blowing out of the house, blowing out of the crawl space. Or to pressurize it, it? To depressurize it so that it's blowing all that stuff out oh, of yeah, the house gotcha. and rather than, you know, getting wrapped up in that duct work and sucked into the house. So the, the magic uh, number is you need to get the uh, wood below 20% or lower uh, for that fungus to be arrested. And that's pretty much the only thing you can do. Until you do that, if you do put the new wood in contact with the old, it'll start rotting almost immediately. What I found most interesting about my fungus research was that um, once, so the fungus goes through like three phases. It's first spores, and then it goes into hyphae, which are the kind of fuzzy looking stuff that's in this uh, photograph. And once it gets to be... Um, sufficiently developed that gets a fruiting body, which is toadstools, shelf fungus. You see these things on in our landscape and on buildings. And when those things start uh, producing their own spores, 
it can pump out um, five million spores per minute <laughs> <laughs> over a period of many days. So that's what you're saying is no matter what happens, there's going to be these spores in the basement that are going to as long as those yeah. joists are there. Yeah. Now. I'm curious. I had I hadn't had time to really look into this, but you know, we were talking recently about the antimicrobial microbial qualities of lime washes. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> on a more modern sense, I mean, you you Patrick recently were looking into primers and sealers, mm -hmm. and there's all these different specialty sealers. Do we know? Are there any acceptable? You know, mold-resistant coatings that people could put. I, I I saw some people online mentioning using shellac-based sealers on wood in situations like this. You mean to like kind of arrest the mold? Yeah. Yeah. So there there are fungicides uh, and mildicides that'll kill stuff like this for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think they're copper-based largely, uh, but I'm I'm getting into stuff I haven't researched. So yeah. I shouldn't be talking I, about it. I would wonder if that would have to impregnate the wood mm -hmm. entirely, not just be on the surface with the amount of damage that's already here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and um, when he said that some of them were lacking in solidness, what was his word? Yeah. Anyway, Punky, yeah, I, integrity, you got to, you got to fix those, right? That's because mm -hmm. that's going to keep going. So get that dried out. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Another Jeff. We still have another Jeff. Okay, so this is Jeff None from... None of them are me. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jeff from Connecticut, but not this Jeff. Good morning, gentlemen. A few weeks back, you read a question from Reader regarding window condensation in the colder months. We live in Connecticut, and we face the same issue, which is the basis of my question. Our home was built in 1983, and it's a 2,500-square-foot colonial. It does not have central air conditioning. Uh, we have baseboard heat supplied by a gas-fired condensing boiler. We have two adults, two older kids, high school and middle school, and two dogs living in the house. Uh, since condensation is caused by excess moisture in the home, what can we do to remove the moisture? I thought of an ERV slash HRV, but since we don't have any ducks, not sure how to proceed. Would two bathroom fans do the trick? Any advice would be great. So I had a couple more questions for Jeff, so I emailed him yesterday. And I asked him, do you currently have bath fans? Are they effective? Do you have a lot of house plants or a wet basement? What are the quality and vintage of the windows? And he wrote back and said, we have um, 26 windows. Three of them are in the basement. 12 are new Anderson 400 series uh, windows. We're slowly replacing all the windows. 10 are double hungs, two are casements. The remaining windows are certain teed vinyl replacement windows which will be replaced over the next two years with Anderson 400 series windows. The house has a walkout basement. The basement is finished with a drop ceiling and doesn't appear to have any moisture problems. We do run a dehumidifier in the basement during very humid days or when it seems damp. <clears throat> we do not have a lot of house plants, but we do have two dogs. <laughs> mm. One is 95 pounds and one is 75 pounds. They are both Labradors. All the bedrooms are upstairs. The two full baths are upstairs, half baths on the first floor. Just the master bath has an old bathroom fan that we don't use since it needs to be replaced. We haven't replaced it since we don't know who to call, uh, what type of trades do this kind of work. We'll replace it with a Panasonic. And I f my final question was, do you have any other combustion appliances and does your dryer vent go outside? Mm -hmm. So besides the... Uh, boiler, which has a direct vent, they have a tank style gas water heater. And why is that important? There's a lot of water coming out of combustion gases. Yes. So if, if his water heater was not venting correctly, mm -hmm. it would fill the house with water vapor and more importantly, carbon monoxide. So that's what I told him to, to check. check first. Yeah. Also, have you considered adoption? <laughs> You got keep the dogs, but those two kids are, those gonna be kids are making soon. a lot of water. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Rob? Well, uh, I'd say you know you really have to just start by figuring out how Where, much moisture you have in the house. Yes. So you know, getting um, good hygrometers, good, good hygrometers, good moisture meters, uh, even some of those little um, like weather station type water meters, put a couple of those around the house just to kind of monitor, see how much moisture is in the room when you're ha seeing these symptoms and, and checking what the temperature is outside. Because 
uh, you know, everyone's going to have some moisture in the air, and the colder, the the bigger difference in temperature between the inside and the outside, you're going to have even on halfway decent windows uh, some condensation in the middle of the coldest part of the winter. So, uh, I would remind you though, if you are having condensation problems, definitely check your combustion appliances and make sure that they're venting correctly because it is a very serious concern. Yeah, I can tell you as a sure. kid that our windows were always foggy um, in the house where I grew up in, but it went away as soon as my dad cleared the chimney flue. Really? Uh, it was so obstructed that all that gas was coming in the house, and it's wow. a wonder none of us were you know, really sickened by that. Man. Well, I've got these same windows in my house, in most of my house. Anderson so the certain or the Anderson 400s? The 400. Anderson 400s. Okay. Um, and there are a few old ho- windows left in the house, and they have storm windows on the outside. They don't have condensation problems, the old ones. The Anderson 400s, all wet pretty much all the time, it seems like. Really? No, yeah. That's so surprising to it's me. It's crazy. And it, I don't know. They're, they're like his, relatively new. They were uh, put in by the person we bought the house from mm-hmm. um, just a few years before we bought it. And uh, already, I mean, there's like basically <laughs> mold uh, on all the wooden parts of the window, I would say. And so I'm, I'm constantly going back and cleaning it. And, you know, w- we have a dehumidifier that was in the basement. Um, I brought it upstairs. I was running it at, at basically the max capacity down to like 45 percent, I think, is the max on that. And uh, that's relative ha- humidity. That's relative humidity. And it was still happening. So yeah. I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of flummoxed by the whole thing. Well, um, well, if if he rules out the combustion concerns and if the humidity seems within a safe range, which what do they recommend? Something between 30 and 50 percent in the winter in a house. Does that sound about right? Or well, anything that... above you know 60 percent, 50 percent, you start having um, dust mite proliferation. So I mean, yeah. lower is better, especially if you have allergies. Sure. And uh, so... Jeff absolutely has to get bath fans, though, yeah, right? I mean, that is a fundamental was, problem. That's and where he, I was going with that, yeah. He, he uh, Every house needs bath fans. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I visited a house in, in Vermont one time when I was working at Green Building Advisor, and it was a very tight house, and the owner was really smart about the air quality in the house. And he, he you know, what he was talking about is how... The more people you have in your house, in a, in a, in a modern house, you're going to have a huge difference in the amount of moisture in the house. Heck, yeah. When you're co- if you're also if you cook a lot, especially if yeah, you cook and pasta or rice a lot, you without know, a range you, hood yeah, too, yeah. right? You're going to be pumping all that water vapor into the air. So basically, anytime people are cooking or running the showers or doing any of those other activities, you definitely need ventilation during the, that time. Yeah. And house plants do put a lot of water into. Uh, the air and yeah. so do teenagers and so do yeah. teenagers lots of showers so yeah. <laughs> lots of talking yeah <laughs> <laughs> so as far as the f- ventilation fans go i mean uh you if it's a regular problem and it doesn't seem to be just a like a momentary problem based on use use of bathrooms or cooking then they probably want to have bath fans maybe even on a timer that it's yes. cur- circulating on a regular basis or um you can even get uh Fan switches that are uh, humidistat, uh, controlled. humidistat controlled. I hear those are very re- unreliable, though. So really? I've heard that you should not use those. Okay, so basically, timer are... is, is a good choice. If if you if it's a regular concern, then you just run a couple of bath fans on timers. Um, what do you like in the way of bath fans? Because that makes a huge difference. I mean, I uh, haven't done research on it in a while. I've I've got a I've got a couple of I think they're fan techs or. Uh, they're the they're like remote ones with the, yes. the duct work, so that you. So we have a photo of that. So this is what Rob's talking about. And I'm a huge fan of these too. So the fan, it motor, the blower part actually goes up in the attic and it sucks the air from the bathroom through this insulated through insulated duct work using the outlets, uh, the grills. And some of them have lights in the grills, and some do not. You can get it both ways. But this is an outstanding product. And I love these for retrofit because it's a lot easier to fit the motor up in the attic and a wide, you know, especially if it's, um, you know, un- what? Unfinished. Unfinished, right? If it's an attic. Yeah, and an- another thing, too, is... It's that, well, quiet. It, that's one of the main uh, reasons people get these is because they're super quiet because the fan is not attached to your drywall and your ceiling and right over your head. It's, right. It's somewhere else. And uh, then it uses, uh, you can use, like, the, the soft duct work to get up to the fan. It has to be insulated. <clears throat> yeah. 
has to, that's important. In fact, the kit that I had came with, I think it came with the insulation. I'm not sure. but uh, Insulating your uh, ventilation fan duct work in, in a heating climate is really important. Otherwise, you, the airstream is cooled down and you'll get the water will condense in there yeah. very quickly. And yeah. it starts to drip back in the house or drip onto the drywall around the fan. It's it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I even, I even Do went... you guys have insulated duct work for your ventilation fans? No, not only that, but I even uh, mounted the fan higher than the outlet so that the last couple feet of the ductwork are leaning, sloping, down. sloping downhill That's towards the practice. exterior wall. Because even if there's no condensation in the ductwork, towards the outlet, you could get some condensation on, a, on the cold cold uh, weather. Did you insulate your... I tried to do that. Remember? <laughs> I, <laughs> there's no room, that, right? I, yeah, I couldn't get it through yeah. where I needed to get it through. So it's through insulation most of the way, and then it goes up about four feet at the end. And uh, I can tell you, we don't even shower in that bathroom, but I, I run that thing a lot, yeah. you know, to try to deal with humidity. And uh, I checked it two weekends ago, I think, and I had, yeah, at least a couple cups of water in, in the hose. <laughs> in, in the hose. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much where it came out of out of the insulation, it right. was all just pooling right there. And yeah, obviously, that's not going to work so good. No, it wasn't going to be long before that started to drip back through yeah. the fan. But yeah, I've got one similar to this. They're really not that hard to install yourself. I no. mean, if you're a little bit handy, the instructions are pretty thorough. You do need to run some wiring, right? So that might scare mm -hmm. some people. Yeah, but I mean, if he's got the existing bath fan, you're yeah. basically putting it back right in the same spot. You should, you know, if, if there's a J box. Not if he's using one of these. If he's using a Panasonic or mm -hmm. you know a regular bath yeah. fan that's in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not a hard project. No. The problem is that, like, the the hole you cut in the ceiling is never the same for the new fan, seemingly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I had to rip out the entire ceiling in that anyway <laughs> because the previous owner, they had – the the fan that was in there was probably original from, like, the 1950s, and there was no ductwork connected to it at all. So that thing was just venting into the insulation. Yeah, that, so bad. That is so common. <laughs> that brings up something I was going to mention anyway, is that, he, you know, you, you had asked, oh, is there a dryer? Does it vent to the outside? I can't tell you how many times I've seen people vent bath fans. And bath fans, one thing, but a dryer, which is basically extracting gallons of moisture from your clothes <laughs> and then just dumping and that water into And if it's gas, it's also, your... like, exhausting combustion gases, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, there, yeah, there was – there. I, I remember um, – I don't know if it was a QA and a on, on one of the websites or what, but there was a woman who had a house that was like three months old, and she was drying her clothes on clotheslines in her attic, which had OSB sheathing. Oh, my God. And within three months, the sheathing was all moldy from – doing that it's like oh i'm going to save energy by doing this and it's just <laughs> you, you gotta understand a little bit about physics and and science in some of these situations and use your yeah. head people yeah. um jeff we're coming into the cold weather so if you do have elevated moisture in your house if you get the bath fans running if you leave them on it's gonna bring in dry exterior air into the house and dry the house out so i mean you can you can run them a lot until you get the house dried out, and that might be a smart idea. And uh, like Rob said, getting accurate data on what the humidity levels are would also be valuable, and you may need to run a dehumidifier more often than you have been. Yeah, I think waiting until it feels damp yeah. is probably, I don't know how much he's going down there, but if you're not basically living down there, you don't know how often it's feeling damp. <laughs> yeah, and uh, boy, just put it on I, mine a, runs pretty much all the time in the summertime. Yeah, I just set mine to like 50 percent and, and it just goes and goes and it dumps right into the sump pit so i don't have to go down there and dump it out every half hour yeah. I I do have to dump mine. and in the summertime it's twice a day which yeah. is a drag yeah yeah a lot of people probably don't realize how much moisture could be coming into your house from a basement and and like you said how you don't really notice how moist it is down there because you're not hanging out down there yeah if you're getting like mold growing on your stuff that's a dead giveaway mm-hmm <laughs> <laughs> Should we do one more? Let's do this one, Matt. Let's do it. It's a very long one. question, and it involves straw bale construction. So this is right up your alley. <laughs> Am I wrong? Yeah, pretty much. The one of the questions I don't I, is not a detail that I've. I'm very so, should we read his whole thing? It's it's really long. I don't know that you need to to read. So the, the question thing. is, he's putting down uh, straw bales, and this is now in the in the code. This is uh, in the twenty twenty fifteen code, bale. right? Yep. So there are prescriptive guidelines for building with straw bales. Believe it or not, um, 
And the detail is to pour a concrete foundation, have uh, rebar uh, embedded in the concrete at least six inches. You put the uh, hay, the straw, I almost call them hay bale. them. Yeah. I, I almost call them hay bales, <laughs> which is not accurate. Straw no. bales, and that holds them in place. Mm-hmm. And the um, straw bales are elevated on four by four sleepers. Two, yeah, like two by fours usually. Okay, and then a, a layer of foam, sort of in between those uh, sill plates. So um, this question from Anthony. Uh, involved the code requires uh, a class two vapor retarder between the concrete foundation and the first course of hay bales. Yeah, that's if you're putting the bales essentially on the foundation. There are other there are other ways to do it. I mean, you could build a floor system on top of the foundation and then put your bales on top of that too. And that's that the the one house that I worked on. That's what we did. So we didn't have to have that vapor retarder there. But most homes. A straw bale homes are in warm places that probably are being built on a slab, is they, my guess. They may be, yeah. yeah not but necessarily, there's quite, a few, there's quite a few in the Catskills, I can tell you that. <laughs> just... I, know it's, I know it boggles your mind, but it's it, it's up there. There's uh, people up in Vermont doing it. I mean, it's Minnesota kind of... Minnesota, even? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think the original, you know, straw bales were in, like, Nebraska, and that gets pretty cold in the winter. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so, Matt, you've got some experience with straw bales. What... Yeah. What do you think it is that draws someone, especially outside of the Southwest, where you think it makes more sense, uh, to straw bale construction? Uh, the deep window wells, they're beautiful. Um, I think the plaster, it just looks like, it looks like an old world house. I mean, it looks like a, like an English farmhouse or something like that. Normally you have huge overhangs, um, you know, and, you know, a lot of times they'll put like, uh, stone like blue stone sills on the outside um and it just looks like a classic old house and it's brand new and you have an r value that's like i don't know 30 plus Mm -hmm. you know for almost nothing yeah for almost nothing i mean you're using essentially a waste material what Um, does a what does a straw bale cost do you know i have no idea the actual bale Yeah. yeah like a bale it's like for, for a few dollars, well, right? If you're if you're buying it from your local Agway for your Halloween decorations, it's probably like five bucks. But if you're buying it bulk from some local farmer, it's yeah, a couple bucks maybe, right? Yeah, because I mean, it's waste to them. A lot of places they just burn it. What? I mean, because it's just like the leftovers from like wheat or barley. It, well, you would use it for animal bedding, right? Or you could use it for that yeah. too if you had that. But I mean, a lot of these guys, if you're a grain farmer, you're not also a cattle farmer. Sure. You yeah, and, and if you're if you live in a remote area. And if you live down near where we are, down south of us, there's a lot of horse farms. So there's a lot of market for that, but uh, for bedding. But uh, but if you're living in a, a sparsely populated area, I'm sure there's not, and everyone else is making straw too. Yeah, well, you could probably <laughs> guess my opinion on the thing. What do you think about <laughs> straw <laughs> straw bale homes, Rob? What do I think about straw bale homes? I I think if I lived in a dry climate, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable doing it. I think the fact that you have to do so many more water management details in a damper climate, I'd be a little wary of it. I mean, if I wanted that, I'd probably, if I wanted that same effect, I would probably go with a double stud wall filled with cellulose. Maybe mm-hmm. in a, in a... The, the question I've always wondered, and maybe you can answer this, Matt, is like, why build with the bales? Why not insulate on the interior with the bales? Like, yeah. why not build a conventional light frame structure well, with sheathing and, and you, then... And you can do that also. There, yeah. there are all different kinds of assemblies that you can do. I mean, you don't even need to plaster over them. You can do it with a traditional cladding and just use the bales as an infill for insulation. Um, and then just clad on the interior, just like you would a normal house as well. So mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I seem to remember that because I, I, I edited a, a case study of a house in Minnesota for a green, green building advisor years ago. And I think they basically built a timber frame and then just infilled with the straw bales. Yeah, and that's basically what I think the code is addressing is where, you know, you're essentially just plastering onto the straw bale. Yeah. And but, then it's becoming, it's, it's sort of like, a, it's not a load-bearing wall, but it's sort of structural. Well, the the code assemblies are totally load-bearing walls mm-hmm. using the bales. I, I mean, yeah. I... I presume they have great strength because mm-hmm. they're huge. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of different kinds. I mean, you ha- you can build them as totally load-bearing where you have sort of like a, a, a top timber that's bolted through the entire wall and cranked down mm-hmm. so that the entire thing is sort of like rigid and held together. But a lot of times it's just, like you said, you build a, a timber frame and then you infill with the bales. 
My only worry is like just keeping the water out because I, I can only imagine what a moldy mess it would get in there if you didn't have everything perfect. Yeah, but I don't know that it's much different from a traditional wall, you know. I mean, other than the fact that you're – I mean, obviously we have a lot of stucco failures in a lot of places <laughs> where there's, there's stucco. That's a topic for another um, but, yeah. I mean, discussion, these, but I yes. think when people are, are building these houses, they're paying a lot more attention to the problems that they can have with the stucco, and they're building much deeper overhangs and they're keeping those houses low. They're not building two or three story uh, straw bell houses and, and, and forgetting yeah. to build deep overhangs. They're building two, three, sometimes even bigger foot overhangs over a, a one story house. But like as an example, how do you detail, you were talking about one of the things that you find appealing are the deep window wells, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could put the window on the exterior plane, right? Or yeah, on the is, interior plane. Which or, is more typical for straw bales to put it on the outside and then you have almost how like you free like, seating or shelving space on the inside. How do you get like water, you know, flashing well, you, to stick on yeah. straw? Well, you, cause you're not, building it on the straw or you're not Im embedding it in the straw you're building a window buck uh to hang that on mm -hmm. so it's probably kind of similar to when you do exterior foam insulation a lot yeah, of times exactly. people detail that that they build those plywood bucks to get the window to mount to and to flash to mm -hmm. it's and then, exactly and the then same. you just let that into your plaster i think, I think any windows make no <laughs> sense on any structure but <laughs> Patrick hates yeah. light. He's a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> I like We're, you, you is, put the window at the, the right you put the window on the sheathing plane, and it makes life so much easier. And it's yeah. it's more foolproof, mm -hmm. right? Am I wrong? Well, plus uh, you have that extra space on the inside of the house that you're not wasting. I mean, people like the inset window look, and I I, I get that, but boy, is it a hard way to put a window in? Yeah, I don't think I would do that with straw bale. No. Yeah, I don't think I would do it anything. But going, going back to your question about, you know, would it be a moldy mess, you're talking more about sheathing and flashing details than the actual insulation pro being the problem. Totally. Because, because you think about cellulose is just shredded paper, so it's yeah. not really any any different. It's just a matter of the that what you picture as the typical construction details in a straw bell. Yeah, there's no sheathing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like... But what? there wasn't sheathing in a lot of these old houses either. I mean, if you were building an old timber frame, then you were just... Putting. Agreed, but it, it also had open cavities or yeah. drying. You no, know, that's like true. it's not like it's yeah. not going to hold water for very long. Right. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, this guy is asking about sort of this vapor retarder between the concrete. Oh yeah, I forgot about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it, and his he was talking about using either fifteen or thirty pound felt, and I think that that is a no go. I don't know where he heard that that was a class two vapor retarder. Well, and it, I know and it's it list, isn't. Some people list it as that, but yeah. I don't think that that's accurate. It's really a three. Yeah. You need to look at the code, what that asks for, what it defines as a class two vapor retarder, and it's talking about, uh, what, 0.1 to 1 perms. It's funny that um, the only example I could find was uh, craft facing on fiberglass bats, right, is a yeah. class two. Right. Which means it's between 0.1 and 1 perms. Yeah, if it's bitumen coated. I believe. The tar right. stuff. Yeah, the yeah. tar stuff. Um, but membrane, that is a, you know, basically plastic from certainty. That's supposed to be a class two vapor but that's retarder. A, <laughs> that's an interior product. I don't know if you can put that on concrete. And I don't know either. My suggestion would be to contact one of the companies that makes a spray applied uh, WRB or foundation coatings. I think a roll of applied coating can probably satisfy this need for a class two vapor retarder in I'll this. Yeah. In this location. Also, I would contact some people who are already building straw totally. bale houses. Yeah, I mean, that's you, really you the, call, the you way to go. Yeah. I mean, wrong show the question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I hate to throw Ace McCarlton under the bus, but um, <laughs> call he would new know. frameworks. Yeah. He would know. He can probably tell you exactly what you need to do here. The thing is, like in Vermont, where they build, like, there's no one checking for this. So it's up to them to do the right thing. And I'm not suggesting they wouldn't, but like class two, class three, class one, no one's going to know the difference mm -hmm. in Vermont. And there's plus, just not enough code enforcement. Plus when people are typically building, you know, sort of these outside of the box kind of, I don't want to say fringe, but like, you know, uh, uh, uncommon, <laughs> uncommon building s methods, especially people who are kind of, you know, find romant romanticized older systems that are in place. You got to, sometimes those people are kind of 
latching onto something that they learned that might be out of date. So that's why it's really it's really good to go to the experts who are doing the cutting edge stuff now. Yeah. And now is there a, is there some sort of association? Um, yeah, there are different ones. Where is this guy located? I don't even remember. We don't know. Okay. But, yeah, there's uh, different kinds of green building organizations or, you know, energy yeah, what, is, what is that one on the West Coast? I think Bruce King has some, <sighs> like, natural building. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up. But yeah, it's, uh, we can put it up on the website. Yeah. Look it up. and <laughs> the, 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 do, the thing I do like about the straw bale is the – Low embodied energy. I mean, like that. That's a qu- conversation we really need to start having in the building industry. Like, concrete and foams uh, are incredibly energy intensive. And boy, you know, if you could take a waste product like this and build a good assembly with it, pff, why not? Yeah. Somebody else should, not me. Yeah, yeah. Because so many, so many of these energy efficient or alternative building systems are focused on the bottom line. They're focused on saving someone. Their elect on their electric bill, but when you, they're not looking at the big picture on, on what impact it is having on their local environment or on the or on the global environment. Yeah, I uh, I'd love to see a well done straw bale home under construction just to ask these kind of questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd love it if he sends some pictures in of this project yeah, totally. he's working on. And I think he's uh, asking these at the right time. He hasn't started building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so many people like think about this when they're like after the concrete's on the ground. Right. But I mean, the code also allows you rather than using the insulation between those uh, sill plates, you can also use gravel or something else that's semi vapor permeable. Um, and you can just get a, usually I think what most people use is is uh, rigid foam XPS. So between those. so concrete foundation, rigid foam, straw bales. Yeah, and I don't know about it. I think you probably do have to have that vapor retarder underneath, you know, underneath the plates and that foam. But yeah. I, I, you may be able to get away with just the foam. You might have to just ask your code enforcement officer what they're gonna, what they're gonna allow you to do. Yeah, my my guess is that there might not be that person where you know you're building a straw bale home in many cases. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. You have anything to add? No, I'm all set. What do you think? Go for it, dude. I want to see it. Yeah. Would you build one? Oh, in a second, yeah. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> <laughs> They're labor-intensive, though. I mean, you know, you think you're going to save money by using all these, you know, these leftover Oh, come on. One of the selling points bales. is you have all your friends over and you just stack, yeah, and you do a, stack yeah, straw bales. a plaster party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's you a, don't, it doesn't work? I mean, I guess if you have enough friends, but I mean, teaching people how to plaster, it's going to take <laughs> no, you just as long as doing it yourself. <laughs> I had enough trouble teaching uh, Habitat for Humanity drywall finishers how to finish drywall. I can't imagine what it'd be like spreading, yeah. you know, full plaster coat on. Well, at least with plaster, you know, the expectation that it's going to look a little bit messy. Rustic. And you're going on to yeah. straw bales, which are not flat. I mean, you can sit there with a chainsaw all day and try to saw them down to like a flat plane, but it's never going to be perfect. Is that how you cut them? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that and a sledgehammer, and you try to push them from either side and get them flat and stuff handfuls of straw in between. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. 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 Now, if, I, if I'm going to build an alternative place like that, I'll probably go out west and build an earth ship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for go those of you house. who don't know, that is uh, <laughs> tires filled with dirt. Rammed <laughs> earth, not dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's another good idea. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time for we have for today. Thanks to... Matt and Rob for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us wherever you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. And if you haven't had a question answered and you want to let us know how we did, if our advice was sound or unsound, uh, please let us know that also. Happy building. Happy building.